Good morning and welcome everyone to our event on the Global Fragility Act and the importance of citizen-centered governance, co-hosted by the International Republican Institute and the National Democratic Institute. Now for opening remarks, I am pleased to introduce Ms. Stephanie Rust, NDI's Chief Programs Officer. Ms. Rust is responsible for NDI's program design, delivery, and impact including oversight of NDI's technical and functional teams. I turn it over to you, Ms. Rust. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone, <clears throat> and welcome. On behalf of NDI and IRI, I'm absolutely thrilled to open this event. It comes at an extremely important moment for the Global Fragility Act. <clears throat> As many of you are aware, President Biden and the White House transmitted the GFA country strategies to the Hill on Friday, representing the culmination of an enormous effort by many of you on this call in the US interagency, at embassies and leaders in civil society in GFA countries and the West Africa region. <clears throat> Congratulations to all of you. NDI and IRI carefully selected the focus for this event, citizen-centered governance because we think this is the essential goal for the US partnership with the GFA counterpart countries. <clears throat> countries are stable when state society relations produce policy outcomes that citizens view as effective and legitimate. The institutions that NDI and IRA work with, legislatures, political parties, local governments, independent electoral bodies, all help to shape and strengthen these important state society relationships that are so central to citizen responsive governments. As we inaugurate <clears throat> the second Summit for Democracy this week, it is really important to understand the linkages between democracy strengthening and climate prevention. The summit offers important opportunities for us not only to advance democracy globally, but also to reduce and prevent violent conflict, which has become a greater risk as a result of the COVID pandemic and the effects <clears throat> of poverty, inequality, and marginalization. I would now like to introduce Under Secretary of State for Civilian Security, Democracy, and Human Rights, Azra Zaya, who has taped opening remarks for this event. Under Secretary Zaya has dedicated her professional career to strengthening democracy and advancing human and democratic rights. She has served as president and CEO of the Alliance for Peacebuilding, and during her multi-decade career in the Foreign Service, she has served as acting assistant secretary and principal deputy assistant secretary in the State Department's Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. I will now turn it over to Undersecretary Zaya to discuss the importance of democracy for stability and peace. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. I wanna to start by thanking our esteemed hosts, the International Republican Institute and the National Democratic Institute, which continue to be indispensable partners. They have been at the forefront of democracy promotion and conflict prevention for decades, and we're lucky to have their expertise. Additionally, I wanna recognize the participation and invaluable contributions of our partner country panelists. Your leadership, both in and out of government, helps us strengthen inclusive, responsive governance and build more peaceful, prosperous communities. While we all have diverse perspectives to bring to the table, we all strive to promote democracy, enhance accountable governance, and prevent cycles of conflict and instability. It's this shared desire that inspired the Global Fragility Act and the associated US strategy to prevent conflict and promote stability. This strategy serves as a framework to forge enduring strategic partnerships around the world and to foster peace. I'm pleased to share that we have completed and President Biden has submitted to Congress 10-year plans for advancing partnerships with the strategy's focus countries and region. And now the hard work of implementation begins. We will marshal and integrate diplomatic efforts and foreign assistance initiatives 
to promote peace and resilience in new ways. We will reform how the United States engages partners using data and evidence to inform policymaking. We will better integrate diplomatic development and security sector efforts. As we speak, Vice President Harris is making a historic visit to one of these partner countries, Ghana. The Vice President is highlighting our commitment to help Ghana and other West African nations take a holistic approach to address the growing threats of violent extremism and instability. Together, we're working to advance a shared vision that combines inclusive governance, responsive security, and locally driven peacebuilding to promote resilience in the region. The Summit for Democracy is the ideal venue to highlight this critical linkage between democratic governance and conflict prevention. Through our strategy implementation, President Biden reinforces our commitment to strengthen democracy's ability to deliver for their people and prevail over 21st century challenges from climate and pandemic-related disruptions to authoritarian overreach. The strategy highlights that instability and conflict are inherently political problems. Accordingly, sustainable stability depends on strengthening effective, inclusive governance that upholds human rights. Democratic, inclusive governments, in turn, are a source of resilience, which provides a foundation for successful and sustained development progress. This initiative and related programs will expand U.S. engagement in the focus countries and region on democracy, governance, and inclusion. The initiative also entails elevating our commitment to combat corruption in line with the U.S. strategy on countering corruption. The challenges facing democracies today require more integrated approaches. In implementing our strategy, we're seeking to better integrate conflict prevention and peace building alongside development in support of democratic governance, political inclusion, inclusive economic development, accountable security, and respect for human rights. Strategy implementation will entail ongoing consultative processes with civil society and with local and national leaders in each of the partner countries. We will work in coordination with the many actors and stakeholders who can help achieve our common objectives of more peaceful, prosperous, and stable communities and countries. To this end, we've sought to align our efforts with and support national government plans where possible, recognizing that the process of building resilience and fostering peace is a shared one. Today's discussion provides an opportunity to consider how we can better synchronize our collective efforts. We take very seriously the need to engage with civil society organizations moving forward. We are focused on forging partnerships at the local level, including with women and youth to drive change in their communities. With funding appropriated by Congress, we're advancing new programs to engage with marginalized communities to elevate their participation in political and economic processes. The Summit for Democracy provides a critical forum to reaffirm our shared commitment to strengthening democracies, both emerging and established. We know that democratic governance reduces fragility, advances sustainable development, and mitigates violent conflict and instability. Together, we need to demonstrate that democracy, respect for human rights, and non-discrimination can deliver for all people. Today's panel will help us all better understand how we can do this together. As representatives of governments, civil society, the private sector, philanthropy, and international institutions, we need your support, your knowledge, your experience, and your advocacy to help strengthen our common purpose. Democracy is not static. It must be nurtured and supported to overcome challenges. And true modernization requires that we continually iterate and adapt our approaches. I thank you for your time and your commitment to supporting our strategy and helping it forge a more peaceful and democratic future.
Thank you. I want to thank Undersecretary Zaya for sharing these insightful remarks. My name is Kimber Shear, and I am the Executive Vice President at IRI. We are delighted to convene this dialogue on a topic that we are all committed to, how strengthening democracy is key to promoting peace around the world. As the Summit for Democracy brings together leaders to discuss the world's most pressing challenges, it is vital that we take action toward democratic renewal, including by supporting the implementation of the Global Fragility Act. The GFA rightly makes elevating democracy, human rights, and governance a guiding principle. IRI's decade of experience across the globe and our current support in GFA countries substantiates this approach and focus and reflects the reality that conflict is political. Weak state legitimacy and institutions and exclusionary socio-political dynamics enable chronic fragility and exasperate grievances. Some predatory regimes impose these vulnerabilities and fuel conflict by undercutting political oversight feeding corruption, and committing human rights abuses against their citizens. Ultimately, this intensifies the drivers of conflict. When individuals view governing structures and actors as illegitimate, they are more susceptible to be recruited and mobilized by, by violent actors. These existential global threats to democratic development are evolving in ways which will require innovative approaches to overcome. In recognition of these conflict drivers, advancing democracy and governance is key to promoting stability and reducing conflict. Responsive institutions connect the citizens to the state and thus act as peaceful mechanisms for political contest, resource allocation, and conflict mediation. And civil society and media promote critical reforms, open avenues for peaceful conflict mitigation, and strengthen, strengthen social cohesion among divided societies. The GFA places local perspectives from government and civil society at the forefront. To that end, we are fortunate to have some of the brightest minds in the GFA target countries here with us today. I look forward to hearing the panelists' perspectives on these issues. IRI and NDI are dedicated to supporting the U.S. government in its implementation of the Global Fragility Act, and we look forward to continuing our partnership as the country plans are being implemented. With that, I am delighted to introduce our next keynote speaker, Robert Jenkins, who serves as assistant to the USAID Administrator for the Bureau for Conflict Prevention and Stabilization at USAID. Previously, he served as Deputy Assistant Administrator for the Bureau for Democracy, Conflict, and Humanitarian Assistance, and as Director of USAID's Office of Transition Initiatives. Prior to joining USAID in 1998, he worked with World Vision International in Southern Sudan and Sierra Leone. I will now invite Assistant Administrator Jenkins to give some remarks, and thank you. Well, thank you very much, Kimber. Hello, everybody, and thank you to IRI and NDI and all of you for, for showing up today. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm extremely excited to be here uh, with, with what happened over the weekend on the Global Fragility Act with our uh, plans going to, to Congress and to be here on Partners Day for the Summit for Democracy. It's, it's, just, it's a great confluence. So, so I, I hope some of you are half as excited as I am because I'm really excited. Um, at the heart of the Global Fragility Act and our U.S. strategy to prevent conflict and promote stability it's an, is an effort for our government, the U.S. government, to change how we work together so we can be a better partner to, be, to help all of you and with us build a more peaceful, inclusive, and democratic world. That means learning from our mistakes, being strategic, and working holistically across the U.S. government, all of our departments and agencies. Defense diplomacy and development have to work together and have to plan how we're gonna both address urgent needs and make progress towards shared long-term goals. Over the decades, we've realized that prevention to preempt and neutralize potential drivers of conflict is far more strategic because we can do a lot more before conflict break, breaks out. Once there's conflict, our ability to help steer events and help work with partners is limited. Now, one pervasive cause of instability and extremism is weak or exploitative governance that doesn't provide for or protect its people. When people don't feel like they have a future in their country, when people don't feel like they have a voice in how their country is run, and when institutions reinforce those perceptions through their lack of capacity or will, they're more likely to turn to violence. 
Extremism and instability are a symptom of those issues. That's why we need citizen-centered governance and why we need to foster more democratic systems and more democratic resilience. If we're gonna do things better and do them differently, we need to meet people where they are and listen to their assessments of the issues, of the needs, of what has to happen, not come in with existing strategies and so-called solutions of our own. Responsive governance is what democracy means to me. Democracies work because their citizens have a stake in and help shape the public decisions. People have agency, not just a controlling few. And because citizens are given a central role, holding their governments accountable through voting, participation in advocacy, and the freedom to express diverse views, including through peaceful dissent. That's why I am super excited about the new 10-year plans for the strategy that we submitted to Congress. To create these plans, we consulted with a wide variety of stakeholders in coastal West Africa, Libya, Haiti, Mozambique, and Papua New Guinea, ranging from international civil society, other donors and partner governments, uh, civil society and priority countries, local NGOs, community leaders, and perhaps most importantly, ordinary citizens. The issues related to conflict and instability are complex, deeply rooted, and intertwined. Every country and every region is different and needs different solutions. That's why we prioritized and took the time to listen, and we will continue to prioritize and reprioritize over the course of the next 10 years. We use these consultations to identify opportunities for us to work differently and partner with our stakeholders to implement locally led solutions that promote a more peaceful and democratic world. These plans provide for a framework and opportunities for us to engage with countries to escape or entirely avoid costly and dangerous cycles of conflict and instability by building peace and delivering for their citizens. Now, a key aspect of delivering democracy for people is addressing their unmet justice needs that can sow division and create grievances. I'm proud the US is part of the Summit for Democracy's Rule of Law and People-Centered Justice Cohort. These cohorts are made up of government and civil society coming together to make progress on key democracy issues. In this cohort, we sought ways to advance people-centered justice, which at its core is one, listening to the voice of citizens as they define the legal problems they encounter in their daily lives, and two, helping them resolve those problems. Helping people address the legal, the legal problems in their daily life combats grievance narratives that are often exploited by violent extremists and authoritarian states. We need to work together to mitigate risks to stability in a democratic manner, not by suppressing opposition, but by listening to the diverse voices within a society and delivering services that respond to citizens' needs. Advancing pluralism, ensuring fair and equal participation in public life, access to institutions and services, irrespective of, of communal, political, social, economic, and gender divides is fundamental. It's also fundamental, not just as it relates to reinforcing democratic values, but also as a critical element to reducing polarization and for building lasting peace. So thank you again. Thank you all for being here. I very much look forward to the panels and uh, welcome to the second Summit for Democracy. Good morning. My name is Lauren Van Meter and I'm the Director of Peace, Climate and Democratic Resilience at the National Democratic Institute. In this first panel, we are going to focus on good governance and its powerful role in managing and mitigating conflict. We also have specific questions for the panelists regarding the GFA country strategies announced on Friday by Secretary Blinken. So let me begin by introducing our panelists. Kobanan Dongo is a pre prefect of Juan Nogalugudug, located in Northern Cote d'Ivoire. He is an expert in public management and administration and labor and constituency managing, holding a master's degree in private law and a diploma from the National School of Administration of Cote d'Ivoire. Abdonald Dudu is the founding executive director of Euromedia, a non-governmental organization dedicated to civic education, human rights, and democracy. And finally, I would like to introduce uh, 
uh, Member of Parliament, Dr. Antonio Rosario Nequis. He currently chairs Mozambique's Parliamentary Committee for Planning and Budget. In Parliament, he also served as chair of the Parliamentary Office for Youth Affairs, where he steered the approval of a national youth policy informed by the African Charter. He also served for the Committee on International Relations, Cooperation and Communities. So welcome panelists. Um, I would first like to turn to Prefect Kobanan Dongo. You govern the region of Wanagodugu in Northern Cote d'Ivoire, an area of rising insecurity. In your role, sir, as regional administrator, how do you manage community conflicts and promote local, local governance so that your community can be resilient to internal and external threats? Thank you. Let me just mention that it is Wangulu. I just wanted to mention that the name wasn't correct. So uh, to understand what the prefect is doing, we have to understand who is the prefect. The prefect is an a public administration delegate and in this position he is the one receiving the instructions from the government and he applies it on the field and with this mission he makes he makes sure that populations are resilient at a certain level and also his duties are to make sure that the population is uh, well assisted and their needs are met that are economic, social and cultural needs and also to make sure that he meets uh, unity and national cohesion. And concerning security, he is in charge of order and tranquility in his municipality. Within this, with these duties, uh, I would like to mention that to manage uh, the fight against violent extremism and insecurity, the prefect has as missions to be besides population in order to create a certain trust as a representative of the administration and uh, create enabling conditions so that the population should have should trust the representative of the administration. And once the population have a certain number of issues, the prefect is in charge of providing solutions. He also needs to help the population to identify the causes of conflicts, sensitize the population to fight against these conflicts and uh, empower the community leaders so that they should take these initiatives. And once all this is done and we have a conflict, the prefect has to make sure that a solution is quickly found. And to do that, we use two mechanisms. We have uh, our traditional conflict resolution mechanism, which is still enforced. But when it is necessary, we use it. But the other mechanism is also a friendly conflict resolution. That is to make sure that the stakeholders through negotiation find uh, solutions to the conflicts that uh, arise. So this is in a summary what I wanted to say to answer this first question. Thank you, Prefect Chair. Um, Mr. Dudu, may I turn to you? The Prefect Chair has spoke very eloquently um, around local governance and its important role in conflict resolution. You, Mr. Dudu, um, are also uh, a, an, an expert um, in strengthening local governance. Um, so it would be great to hear you speak not only to Haiti, um, but perhaps to the Prefect's comments. 
And what I would like to ask specifically are what are the key governance deficits that continue to shape instability in Haiti? And what innovative strategies have you applied as a leader of civil society that has successfully promoted democratic governance and peace against this complex backdrop? And are, are they similar to those being um, implemented in Cote d'Ivoire? Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, as uh, the time is very short, it, I will be uh, more at ease to speak in French. I will go in French. Uh, the first thing, work on the conflict prevention at the local level means to improve dialogue between the various sectors at the local level and particularly between political and social stakeholders to gather what at jury media we call key local governance entities. I'll just give uh, the specific case of IT, but I'm sure that there are similar structures in almost all the countries. First, we have the members of parliament, which are divided in two categories. The members of parliament who are ad administrator of uh, a locality, and you also MPs who have the control of those administrating a locality. In IT, we call them uh, municipal councils or mayors, and the the other way we have the municipal assembly, which is like a, a junior parliament at the level of the territorial community or the local government. And the third entity is the civil society. We are used to take into account other forces, that is the private sector, that we usually involve it with the social strategy during dialogues and other political stakeholders who are not elected and we take them as members of the political party and they are included in the dialogue. Once the dialogue at the local level is uh, has started, we give uh, the floor to each and every one to enlighten on the issues, to discuss on the stakes of development stakes at the community level. This helps uh, to prevent all incomprehension, which may lead to violence. So conflict is a normal thing. It is just a consequence of a relation between individuals. It is even advisable to have conflict because if we all think the same way, if we all see things the same way, there won't be a way to enrich our way of doing things. There won't be connection. So conflicts are quite solitary. The issue now is when we are unable to manage them or to transform it in a positive way. As far as we are concerned, we drafted a tool which is this dialogue objectively what we call a local democracy barometer which helps with simple indicators to help stakeholders discuss on our current situation in terms of governance in terms of the the participation of citizens to govern them in terms of transparency in terms of you know, accountability of local leaders towards citizens when we articulate this uh, dialogue process at the local level on a permanent basis. This helps to anticipate uh, conflicts that may arise. What usually happens is that these processes are backed by a project that is funded by external donors on a 
short term. And once the program is over, this dynamism couldn't be pursued. And this is why we really congratulate this Global Facility Act, Fragility Act, which help us to work on a more global to mission. Um, I would like to pause at this moment. Um, we are having difficulty, I realize, with the interpretation um, of your uh, wonderful remarks. Um, and I'm wondering if um, we can have the host um, provide um, some guidance to Mr. Juju um, so that we can hear, clearly hear your remarks. Um, in the meantime, okay. while in the meantime, while we work out that technical difficulty, may I turn to um, Member of Parliament Nikwis. Um, Mr. Juju has spoken, um, you know, in depth uh, around the role of Parliament in Haiti, both at the national level and a form of local Parliament um, that is absolutely instrumental in ensuring um, uh, citizen uh, responsive governance. Um, so may I ask you specifically, um, MP uh, Nikwis, um, as chair of the Budgetary Committee and a leader in Mozambique's parliament, what role can parliamentarians play in preventing conflict and what specific policies is your parliament in Mozambique pursuing? And then Mr. Dudu, I apologize. We will go back and have you respond um, to these remarks. Um, so uh, Mr. Nikwis, may I turn it over to you to talk about the role of parliament in Mozambique and conflict prevention? Oh, thank you very much. Uh, bonjour à tous. Uh, good afternoon. You know, uh, parliamentarians play a very critical role uh, as elected uh, officials because we represent our communities, we represent uh, the people. So we, uh, in whatever we do, of course, we have to, to, to do in a manner that it ensures uh, accountability to the voters, and, and I mean, to the people, accountability also uh, with the, the communities. Mm -hmm. So uh, my um, understanding is that uh, uh, we uh, as lawmakers and policymakers, uh, uh, we do need uh, to come up with uh, concrete laws in place that uh, can uh, be more peaceful, that can prevent conflicts, but also to ensure that in whatever conflicts that arises, we can also uh, play a role in uh, conflict resolution. Uh, so uh, my experience um, as a parliamentarian who has been serving in parliament for the fourth consecutive term is that uh, um, we have to be in close touch with our communities or to ensure that whatever we do reflects the people's needs. Uh, we have challenges in terms of good, good governance, uh, but uh, um, the role of parliamentarians in oversight uh, in oversight, the government is also one of the, the critical role because we ensure that the executive or the government of the day uh, can attain the people's needs in terms of fighting against poverty, prevent, uh, preventing conflicts, and also uh, to run the country in a manner that is more safe and secure. Uh, so, um, globally speaking, uh, in terms of uh, what uh, parliamentarians can do, we can share best practices, we can benchmark and uh, learn from others what is better for the humankind uh, in terms of human rights, in terms of uh, uh, good governance, uh, because uh, oh, the parliaments um, also uh, institutions that uh, uh, being an uh, legislative uh, organs, they ensure that we comply 
with good laws and the policies that uh, attains the people's needs. So um, there is a need, and in fact, there is a need uh, to review the frameworks of uh, uh, um, if, uh, what we can say uh, that are the contributions of every country for a better and safe uh, world so that peace must prevail and uh, whatever conflicts arise, uh, our contribution can be uh, um, in a manner uh, that can justify the peace resolution or peace uh, solutions. Um, thank you, Dr. Nikwis, and I think you make a powerful point. I know that you yourself are engaged on the Global Interparliamentary Committee on Preventing Violent Extremism, a very important fora for exchanging exactly um, best advice um, on the role of parliaments um, on this important security issue. Mr. Dudu, um, I hope at this point that, and I apologize, that we've resolved um, the challenges, the sound challenges, and I was wondering if you could provide a brief summary of your remarks, especially um, in relationship to the role that local governments and, and parliaments, um, uh, the work they do together in, in support of ensuring citizen responsive governance. So, Mr. Dudu, over to you for a short summary. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mrs. Metro. Uh, sorry for having uh, talking all this time with no possibility for you to understand what I was saying. Um, I, I tried to summarize what I said before. I, I said when it comes to preventing uh, uh, conflict, first thing, conflict are not negative per se. Uh, conflict are welcome because conflict help to transform the way we do things, conflict help to reform, conflict act to, 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 to improve the way we, um, we, we govern, the way we act. But at the local level, when conflict come, the key is to, to know how to address them, how to transform them. And the best way in our experiences, we, we think, to prevent and transforming uh, preventing and transforming conflicts at the local level. It's uh, in uh, uh, fostering dialogue, permanent dialogue between key actors at the local level. What we call key actors in our experience in German media is first the public actors and the public actors at the local government, we consider that for two categories. The first category are the, 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 the elected uh, 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 officials, who are in charge of managing the, uh, terri the, the territorial uh, uh, government, the local government, government the, the municipality in, in this case. And the second category of the public uh, 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 officials are those in charge of controlling or, or, or overseeing what the, those managing the interest of the resources of the population in the specific municipality are doing. It's what they call the assembly in Haiti, the assemblies uh, and uh, who, 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 which are overseeing the work of the mayors. Now, the, the third actor is the civil society. And, 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 and it's where citizens organized in or, uh, associations in group, group groups of uh, uh, in interest groups are meeting together to work uh, with the elected officials on uh, uh, common uh, issues, on development issues, on how the governance is is. And it's in this context that in Jewish media we developed a tool to facilitate this permanent dialogue between the key actors. It's what I, 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 we call a, 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 a local governance barometer. And I, I concluded saying that it was unfortunate that we, we, we didn't have the opportunity to continue the process and to have it measured and evaluated so, so that we can consider the lesson learned from it because most of the time, a fort for citizens in the civil society to uh, work with uh, the, the, the 
state actors are short-term efforts linked to short-term projects. And in this case, I say we re welcome the initiative of the Global Fragility Act that try to come with a solution to that by uh, coming with a strategy on 10 years, which uh, allow to uh, set uh, long-term goals to pursue an action and to measure the action all over the years so that we can see what are the best lessons we have learned from this initiative. And it is a good thing that from the beginning in uh, designing the strategy, it, there is a conversation with civil society, state actors in those, those working on the field so that we can uh, um, prevent, we can prevent from uh, making the same mistakes we have uh, um, uh, made uh, before, uh, trying to help uh, the countries uh, resolve uh, their fragility, their um, instability uh, uh, problem. So Mr. Du, I, I actually think that, that that is a powerful point, and I've actually seen your barometer, and I think your barometer and DIIRI polling provide important feedback um, to government officials um, on how uh, responsive they are being to citizens' interests, so thank you for raising that important point. I would like at this point, if we can, in the remainder of our panel, to turn to um, some specific questions um, around the Global Fragility Act. Mr. Dudu, you've led the way um, in raising how the Global Fragility Act will support better long-term democratic strengthening in your country in Haiti. As you all know, the Global Fragility Act outlines the U.S. government's multi-year commitment to partnering with governments and citizens in your countries to build long-term resilience and peace. And I'd like to ask each of you specific questions regarding the GSA strategies and how they will be implemented in your countries. Um, Dr. Nequise, um, the Global Fragility Act contains several economic commitments that are integral to the comprehensive strategies comprehensive country plan for Mozambique. For example, supporting socioeconomic growth to reinforcing national leadership and economic reforms. You oversee the all important budgetary committee. What areas of socioeconomic growth are critical to demonstrate that Mozambique's government is delivering for its citizens? And I'd like to ask you a specific question and what socioeconomic growth is critical to weakening the growing insurgency in the North? Thank you, sir. Oh, thank you. That's a really good question. Uh, you know, uh, the insurgency in the north is related to the challenges on oil and gas industry. You, I'm sure you are aware that Mozambique has uh, discovered a, um, a huge quantity of oil and gas. So then uh, we are now uh, on the process to exploit or we already started offshore and uh, challenges related to security um who in the core uh business because you can't guarantee that uh, uh, all uh, the local content needed to develop the communities is secure if you still have this terrorism ongoing in Cabo Delgado. So uh, this is one of the biggest challenges that we are facing. But uh, we uh, actually today, I was just sharing uh, before this meeting, uh, uh, public hearing because Mozambique is coming up with a, a sovereign fund uh, because we consider that the huge amount of money we are going to uh, collect from uh, the revenues generated on the oil and gas industry will uh, demand the specific uh, policies to ensure accountability, transparency, and uh, uh, good governance in terms of how we are going to apply this money for the benefit of our communities, for the benefit of our people. So uh, we still have uh, challenges related to climate change. So Mozambique was one of the countries in the region who 
which was devastated very recently by uh, the cyclone threat. And uh, well, it will need a reorientation of priorities because you have a public infrastructure which has been uh, 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 demolished completely. I'm talking about health sector, uh, hospitals, I'm talking about uh, um, education sector, uh, schools. Uh, we have uh, people who are uh, displaced and uh, schools which are not as of now operating. So it means that our children are not studying in some of the areas where the cyclone was really uh, a big disaster, like uh, in the central uh, part of uh, Zambezia province. So, well, we have a still a lot of challenges and to name some of them uh, in the area of uh, macroeconomic uh, uh, needs. Uh, we just came up uh, recently with some reforms, uh, legal reforms to ensure that we can fast track the economy, uh, facilitate the business, uh, the business environment, because we will need to have a strong private sector entering into the business. And with it, 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 this uh, huge boom on oil and gas industry, I think uh, upstream, midstream and downstream now, uh, a lot of uh, uh, companies can seize the moment, can take advantages. But of course, uh, we need to ensure and guarantee the security because uh, I don't think uh, we can move ahead. We can generate progress. We can generate uh, 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 this uh, development, if we still have uh, uh, challenges related to security, uh, which is mainly carried on by these terrorist groups up north of the country. So um, most of the investments, uh, if you uh, have a look to our annual uh, 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 budget, which is still uh, uh, with a huge uh, uh, deficit, but if we have a look on it, it uh, prioritizes uh, social areas. Uh, it prioritizes education, health uh, sector, um, but also infrastructure. We need to ensure that uh, uh, our communities that uh, are basically uh, located in uh, the coastal areas, which uh, relies on fishing activities, uh, they can also uh, uh, do it in a sustainable way, but can also uh, have this quality of crowns and fish uh, in the uh, most uh, uh, preferred, uh, in the most needed uh, uh, areas. So it demands quality of uh, roads. Because if you move to the interior, then you you just have also challenges in terms of quality of roads, also electricity, and uh, this kind of uh, challenges are being taken into consideration in the program by the government. So uh, I just uh, would say, in a nutshell, that uh, security should be the priority. If you want to generate and uh, stimulate uh, uh, foreign direct investment, then security uh, must be uh, ensured for our investors. And uh, uh, also uh, to make sure that the communities are being uh, provided with basic needs uh, can also take advantages of these natural resources that the country now has a huge. Thank you, sir. Um, Prefector um, Dongo, um, your community um, faces similar challenges um, in terms of um, both economic development um, and, uh, and rising insecurity. Um, MP Nequis has just laid out some very powerful um, solutions, I think, to one of the pressing needs um, in many countries, which is how do you strengthen social cohesion and build trust in communities? Can you tell us where your community 
in Wangaladugu um, is where it is resilient, um, where you have social cohesion and where it needs to be strengthening and what you are doing um, to strengthen it. Thank you, sir. Before we start speaking about the country, we should probably speak about the local aspect and the local situation between Burkina Faso and between Mali. And today we have different communities and different societies, especially when it comes to security. We have seen that since December up till now, we have the number of refugees that we welcome here in our local area. So when talking about taking care of them and about caring is a very complicated thing because we need to provide them with, uh, the, with so many actions, whether governmental or non-governmental, but mainly when it comes to, to the support of our partners, we would like to say that uh, Lately, I had the opportunity to participate in so many works with different associations in order to work hand in hand and organize a number of activities to welcome our refugees and to, to help them. And especially in reinforcing the capacity of population and citizens and make them more resilient to any upcoming challenges, especially for refugees coming from other countries. In terms of the government, what we do, we, we have already done so many steps in order to make our communities more resilient throughout a number of actions. We speak here about achieving a number of social equipments, basic social equipments, and here we talk about it's not a simple thing, but the situation is very complicated, especially that the uh, the number of refugees is growing in our department each and each day. Thank you, Prefect Jordango. Um, Mr. Dudu, um, and my apologies earlier for the technical difficulties, um, we would like to offer you sort of the concluding remarks um, for the panel. Um, again, it is a question around the Global Fragility Act and um, and the country plan for Haiti, um, which one of the key points here is to advance responsive and accountable governance and security. Recognizing, as you mentioned, that this is a 10-year plan, what do short-term objectives look like in Haiti? And what does do long-term objectives look like? And what, how do you, would you define success? Thank you so much for the question. Thank you. It is the most difficult question you ask me now. Uh, prioritizing uh, uh, intervention in Haiti in this situation currently. And there, there is a very big challenge in Haiti. It's how to uh, manage uh, the, the, the urgency of uh, interventions that address long-term issues an intervention that I address short term because there is a mix uh, in the short term and long term. I, I will explain quickly. And the security issue we have now, there, is, there are drivers of insecurity and instability in Haiti, which are structural. First of, of, of all, it's economic. Uh, it, it's led to poverty. One of two Haitians have difficulties to provide themselves food. That's the statistic we have, we, we, we have the, the, this month. 50% of the population that cannot eat, high level of unemployment, a high level of inequalities. And those factors that are structural, they fuel the instability, they fuel the insecurity by providing to gangs and their uh, 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 sponsors uh, a public, uh, a vulnerable mass of people they can use to uh, uh, destabilize the, the, the country and to make their uh, wrong deeds to then criminality. And first thing. Second thing, 
on when it comes to uh, insecurity, the second driver is the, the weaknesses of the institution there, the law, the rule of law system is very weak. The, uh, uh, the, the, the rule of law institution are very weak. And it is those factors that are long-term structural problem to address, but we cannot address security issue without addressing those key factors, just to mention two of them. This is, this is to say, we think that now, supporting the police, for example, is one of the urgent short-term intervention. But when we do it without resolving the political crisis, it is like uh, trying to uh, to 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 to, to uh, uh, drain the water and not closing the the, the 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 i don't know the english term to to that the robinet that 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 give the water in the womb if we have water in the womb and it comes from a hole we should have to close the hole and not trying to drain to drain uh, to drain over and over uh, 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 the womb this is to say what this is to say that the political issue is key. The economic issue is key. We should come with intervention that allow people to get hope because hopeless people are dangerous. I, I, I think I, I should make, make, say it a, a second time. We should come with intervention that give people to people hope because hopeless people are very dangerous. They are dangerous for themselves. They are dangerous for other people. And short term, we should combine support to the police, support, strong support to the political dialogue so that there should be a solution. And when I talk about strong support, I'm talking about not only encouraging them to do something, but proposing them specific strategy to go straight to an inclusive, a very inclusive agreement so that we can move forward. Because if you move forward with some groups and other groups are opposing, you are working for not, op get, uh, uh, not getting good results, not getting sustainable solution. Sustainable solutions should come from political solution, political agreement, very inc large, inclusive agreement. And to go there, we should push the actors to, you, uh, to oh. do it by providing tools, providing methodology, providing uh, a modus operandi, how to move for forward. And I conclude with that, we should come with programs that help people to get hope. Employ employment program, economic program in a country where we import 70% of what we eat here. It is unacceptable. Support to agricultural things. Unfortunately, we don't have time. I would, if we had time, I would show you the result of a study we have just done on, on December that showed yeah. that people that they are priority. Sorry for uh, taking no, too Mr. much time, Judy, I, but I no, think that that's the priorities. No, apologies. I was going to thank you for a very, very powerful ending to this panel. Thank you, Mr. Dudu. Um, I would like to now turn it over. This concludes the panel um, on governance, and I would love to turn it over um, to my very good colleague, Lauren Mooney of the International Republican Institute, who will lead the panel on civil society. Thank you, Professor Dongo, um, Dr. Nequise, uh, Mr. Juju, for a wonderful panel. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren, and thanks to each of you for your insightful remarks. I'm delighted to be here with all of you during a critical moment for GFA implementation. My name is Lauren Mooney, and I'm the Senior Manager for Conflict Prevention and Stabilization in IRI. We'll now move into the event's second panel, where we are joined by civil society leaders from Cote d'Ivoire, Libya, and Papua New Guinea. 
In speaking order, first, I'm delighted to welcome Maitre Francine Akangui, who is the president of the Association of Women Lawyers in Cote d'Ivoire. Next, we're joined by Clifford Piperick, who is a reporter at the Sunday Bulletin, a newspaper in Papua New Guinea. And finally, I'm pleased to welcome Siraj Snusi Al Mahdi, who is the head of the Libya Mediator Network. During this panel, we'll hear insights from these activists on innovative strategies to promote democratic reform and strengthen violence prevention. First, I'll turn to Francine Akangui. Francine, we know that rule of law is the key feature of peaceful democratic societies. Given the evolving threat of violent extremism across coastal West Africa, collaboration and innovation among civil society is critical. With your legal background working in Cote d'Ivoire, what are your insights on how different sectors of civil society work together in your country, whether it's across the peace building, governance, rule of law, or media spaces? What can be done to foster greater coordination across civil society and capture local innovation during GFA implementation? Thank you, Francine. Sorry, but I couldn't reach out to the button of interpreting. That, that means that I couldn't hear you well. I didn't know if I can, if, if I had translation before. Uh, I'm not sure if I have understood you, but thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me to this beautiful international conference. It's, it's a great international debate concerning civil society and because I am the president of a, an association that is made up of legal women and we know exactly what's going on and we, we have so many ideas about the knowledge, about the population, how to help our population, how to advise them legally and how to support them legally speaking and judicially speaking. So concerning this question of how to have better access to justice, it's one of our priorities and problems and challenges. It's the key occupations because we recognize the importance of access to justice and in order to elaborate better state of law. Actually, citizens should be aware that they have the equal access to justice. Once they are aware of this, they have to know how to seize the opportunity, how to use justice for their favor, whatever their age, their race, their color, their religion, their nationality, their belonging. They have to understand for sure and to be convinced that they all have equal access to justice. And that's what we are working on today because this legal access to justice is not available in our country. And we need to know that uh, courts only exist in big cities. We try to probably manage some, some little courts in some uh, uh, small cities, but this doesn't facilitate or guarantee any access to justice for people living in small villages and countryside. This means that this access could be very much limited. Next, we have to bear in mind that 50% of the population are illiterate. So the texts are written in French. We need to, to explain the text, to translate them in local languages so they can understand them. That's another barrier, which is the language barrier that's um, actually um, creates a big problem for us. We also have to bear in mind that the judicial procedures are not always transparent. They're not always transparent and... Uh, uh, sorry. Yes, as I was saying, they're not always updated. Uh, can you hear me? Thank you. That was wonderful. Yes, I did hear you. Okay. Donc, 
Voilà, donc ce que je disais, c'est que les procédures... So what I was saying is that the procedures are not really in our favor and they're not well known, nobody is aware of, of the law or of what we are doing. They're not translated, actually. So we need a translation for the laws, for the languages, local languages mainly. And that's actually our main priority of concern. That's that's what I wanted to share. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you've emphasized some critical issues on the important act on the importance of access to justice um, in marginalized communities. I want to now turn to you, Clifford, for your perspective on Papua New Guinea. Clifford, given your experience as a journalist, what role do you think the media should play in Papua New Guinea when it comes to promoting peace and holding the government accountable? Over to you, Clifford. You're inviting me to this panel. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, I'd like to inform you that it's 12 o'clock midnight here. Yeah. It's right now. It's midnight. Yeah, anyway, uh, you know, your, your question is very, 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 very challenging for the media in PNG, in Papua New Guinea, to uh, hold the government accountable because, uh, as you can see here, you know that the media industry in Papua New Guinea is very small and it's mostly by private organization uh, companies and the companies and you know, companies, they are more concerned about making much money. So, most of the time, they are, they will be promoting, writing the publishing news, not to really, uh, not to really, not to really, say, offend the, the government or the advertisement or the companies. So, then, then, like I've said, uh, the media industry in Papua New Guinea is very, very it is small. And so well, it's, it's, a, it's very, very challenging to hold the government accountable as for the media because uh, the, the journalists here are not probably, they are not really, not really trained. We have uh, very poor conditions for the media. Uh, the conditions are not that, not that good. So a lot of journalists they don't stay long in the in, in their employment and they leave. They leave for for other areas. And so it's very very it's, it's very very challenging for the media to hold the government accountable and PNG. And so yeah and you, we don't really have the type of the media vibrant that we see in other, other countries. You don't really see it in Papua New Guinea. Uh, so, and lately now we have the government. They have now they were passing the new media legislation. In the, they've introduced a bill to further control the media in a sense that they're saying that uh, the media, the government is saying that they've got a protect the journalists. But there's a lot of argument about it, saying that others and all they want to control the media. So there's a big debate. There's a there's a big debate in the in the country at the moment about the control of the media, media in the in PNG. But I but I see that the media can can hold it has played a very big important role in holding the government to the government accountable to yeah accountable so, yeah we like, overall the the media is very very it's very very challenging in Papua New Guinea it's very very challenging to be a journalist uh, because the, the factors are not really not not really conducive for the journalist to really who need to practice what he so basically, I can say that unless you have some more questions, more. 
Thank you. No, that's that's very helpful. And I think you've outlined a lot of key challenges um, when it yeah. comes to media space in um, Papua that's New Guinea. Right. Um, from here, I will turn to uh, Siraj for your insights on the complex conflict and governance uh, situation in Libya. Siraj, what can civil society in your country do to promote democratic gains and peace, even if these gains may be incremental or localized? In your role with the Libya Mediator Network, how has your work helped bridge divides and address pre pressing conflict issues in your country? Today, Libya is going through so much instability because of uh, the lack of a constitution and also institutions that would protect uh, the citizens for more than 30 years. So because of the dissemination of arms, weapons, and the lack of uh, capacities in uh, the country. And the UN delegation in Libya was trying to treat all citizens on an equal basis and also trying to find many solutions in a fair and transparent way in the lack of, in the full lack of uh, the state. But today we ask the international community to help Libya become a democratic uh, free state in order to improve uh, the, the serve, basic services like education, health, and others because today citizens live in instability and a dictatorship all over again. And they agreed upon political accord does not respect the rights of all the citizens. Can we please ask the speaker to speak a bit slowly? And all these efforts have contributed to the success so we would like to thank all these peace builders that are actually convinced that a reconciliation could take place, but we cannot actually achieve or construct a new Libya, a free, a loving Libya that would be democratic without actually the national reconciliation or accord. And we hope to support all these plans and projects through international organizations that are capable of doing so and that have the necessary capabilities. Our network could actually interfere in mediation and reconciliation and also the dissemination of uh, the culture of peace towards an Arab reconciliation and especially in a Murzik region by the help of uh, the ABA. And thanks to the ABA, we reached an accord with all the sects of the community in order to stabilize Libya in coordination with the military and the different actors. We tried as much as possible to restore peace and restore the rights of every citizen. This success was capable because of continuous efforts and a series of meetings that led to the, signal, the signing of this accord. But in the south of Libya, the conflicts persisted, and this is why today the citizen aims or aspires to a peaceful, democratic Libya that actually invests in the stability of the African continent. And we also aspire to uh, host a project that is organized by the international community in coordination with the civil society. The civil society represents the voice of the people of the community. And also this citizen has uh, obligations as well as rights. This is why we seek to raise awareness and that is not easy to do. After the political transition, we seek to implement or realize these goals, these noble goals. Thank you. Thank you, Siraj. And thank you to all of you. I think you've underscored some important issues for our consideration. Um, we do only have uh, 10 minutes left, um, but I would like to ask you all um, for your perspective on the newly released country and regional plans 
um, that are part of the Global Fragility Act. Um, as we've heard, these plans uh, put forth a 10-year vision for peace and democracy in each of your countries. And I'd be delighted to hear what your recommendations may be on what this might look like on the ground and how to capitalize on this opportunity. Um, so starting with Francine, um, if you could just take a few minutes since we're running a little low on time, um, but the, in coastal West Africa, the plan focuses on preventing the spread of violent extremism. You've talked a little bit about expanding the ac access to justice, um, but I'm wondering if you talk a little bit about how expanding access to justice plays a key role in mitigating the threat of violent extremism. And what broader recommendations do you have to promote accountability and justice in Cote d'Ivoire? Thank you. Thank you very much. You asked me so many questions and different themes, but I will try to summarize everything. Yes, we are trying harder to uh, fight vulnerability and to, to help people. Can you hear me? Can you confirm hearing me? Can you hear me through interpreting? Great. So we are really trying harder in order to fight the vulnerability and to manage the population and give them the proper opportunity to have better access to courts, justice, giving them green numbers, phone numbers and call centers that are free receiving their calls. We are raising awareness about uh, judicial assistance in order to allow the population with no means to access to justice and have better financial means. We are also developing hand-in-hand uh, -hand what we call alternative justice, which means that we need mediation, reconciliation, and other plans in order to help resolving problems without necessarily going to court. We have to know that people can have an idea about their files, about their cases, they can work by themselves on this. And you can see that they are more trustworthy and uh, they, they can have better access to justice by avoiding violence and extremism because this starts when extremism and violence starts when you start feeling that you are unjustified there's no e equality towards you but what we are doing right now is we try to help those people in order to feel that they are equal we develop so many skills for them we develop capacities and we try to show them that we have other means in order to resolve problems and to resolve problems we have other solutions and yes when we are more desperate that we use extremism as a way to revolt and to ask for their rights currently we are looking for better ways to provide them with confidence and uh, we have many things to do. Notably, we have to integrate women in the process of justice. And we have to help women have better access to justice and women should understand their rights. And we have 30% of women in the parliament, but still the reality is only 15%. And it's uh, it's a big fight for women. Women are trying to ask and claim their rights. When women is more associated with the rights and with courts and women can work in her own government, own public sector, private sector, women will be more efficient, will feel more confidence, will not feel any more isolation. I think that all these actions, and we have uh, the actions of responsibility, and uh, this has shown that you are citizens. You're not going to just go through the destiny. No, you have the right as a citizen to participate in public life, in decision making in your country, in your village, in your neighborhood. These are all plans and actions that we are trying to put hand in hand with civil society in order to animate the, the, the public environment and to make them feel that Yes, you are a citizen, your voice matters, and we can integrate um, better people in our society instead of extremists. Merci. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Um, it's been wonderful to hear about some of the priorities for expanding access to justice, as well as some of the successes that you found in Cote d'Ivoire. Um, Clifford, I will now turn to you to invite you to share your insights. Um, again, as we only have a couple minutes left, um, if you could keep your remarks to one or two minutes, that would be wonderful. Um, but if you could talk a little bit about the key focus area of the country plan for Papua New Guinea, which is strengthening social cohesion and resilience from the bottom up. Um, how can the media help amplify existing areas of social cohesion and promote peaceful and tolerant messages? Thank you. Basically, the, what, what, uh, the, what the media can do is, if uh, this should be a, a, good, uh, a good funding into the media, uh, especially to to uh, run, like do a lot of uh, pamphlets or or do a lot of awareness on the radio or TV, uh, in uh, because a lot of a lot of the communities they stay in the remote areas and uh, one way of to, uh, to promote to get a misadvertised to do a uh, very good awareness and it's and awareness in in a country like Papua is very expensive, so a cost comes in. Uh, to do a uh, very good awareness. And besides also we have uh, we have three language in, in the in, uh, three main well, well we have eight hundred language speakers, but there, there are three official languages. We have the English, we have the Pidgin, and yeah. we have Mop. And those uh, communicators to do like to to produce the pamphlets or to get an awareness on the radio or TV. It's best that we uh, we we do the awareness seed of three language and also to engage uh, groups to, if to go through the, the communities and they do, uh, let me, they do uh, put a drama, they put, uh, they, put, uh, they put some acting and play. And then and one way, to, and, and, and a very good way is to do, uh, you know, little awareness movies. We, you, when we do, when you produce, uh, small awareness movies, then people watch and and then see, and that's one way for them to to really get a message out. Is yeah, is that to do a small awareness, at least ten minutes awareness to the two movies, you no know, awareness movies on on, a, on that issue. And I'm so that's that will really get uh, get across to the. Uh, get a bit across the people, and of course, like uh, like Elias said, it's it's you you going to need a lot of money to to awareness in in a country like PNG. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we do only have one minute left, so I wanted to um, invite our colleagues to display a slide from um, the U.S. government, um, where you'll see a QR code and link which will direct you to more information on the Global Fragility Act, the US strategy to prevent conflict and promote stability, and the newly released summaries of the country and regional plans. Um, so as our audience takes a look at that um, slide, I will invite um, Siraj for his uh, closing remarks on the GFA country plan for Libya, which focuses on supporting subnational, municipal, and civil society actors, especially in the South. It also acknowledges the need for an incremental approach. What opportunities exist to advance reconciliation at the subnational level, and what strategies have you found to be effective? And if you could um, keep your uh, remarks concise, that would be wonderful. Thank you. So the civil society is going through difficult times, especially on the legal level, therefore, we require the initiatives of the GFA with the cooperation of the civil society and the private sectors, especially for the southern area. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, these are tremendously illuminating remarks. Um, I want to thank each of you uh, for sharing um, some of your insights on the importance of promoting peace uh, through civil society. Um, hopefully these provide um, some interesting uh, insights for all of us to consider, including policymakers, as they move into this week's Summer for Democracy and the important work of implementing the GFA country and regional plans. Thanks again, and this concludes our program.